TCP. Thank you for this. Um, I will mention this a few other times during the talk, but if you want to get a um, hold of us, if you want to provide any feedback, just email us at seedusers at lnl.gov or um, just provide feedback on our GitHub uh, website. Everything that I will describe is open source and freely available on GitHub. All right, so uh, what we have for you today is um, a sequence of uh, six talks. Um, I will start with an overview of the project, um, and then Tim will talk about tuning kernels um, for the new GPUs for Frontier. Noel and Damon will um, present Hipbone, a new benchmark that <clears throat> you will see will be mentioned quite a few times. Uh, Jet has a very interesting talk about um, solid mechanics, um, nonlinear solid mechanics, and performance with P multi grid. Uh, Paul and Malakai um, will then uh, switch to um, high level NECRS, uh, which is uh, one of the flagship solvers we have in this center, uh, and talking about the Poisson solve there, the mat uh, matrix free algorithms for solving the uh, Poisson uh, pressure equation. Um, and then Mission will wrap it up uh, talking about our efforts with uh, ECP applications. Uh, each of these talks will be about 15 minutes plus um, five minutes for questions. I would like this to be an interactive meeting, so please don't hesitate to interrupt us questions during the talks or keep them for after the talks in these five minutes. And we really want to get your feedback. So um, any interest, um, uh, you know, comments on what we're doing or interest in collaboration, please reach out, email, GitHub, um, Confluence, whatever, whatever works for you. All right, so let me get going with the overview of the seed center. So <clears throat> the co design motif for us is uh, how are the methods? Um, uh, uh, this is general um, discretization methods for unstructured grids <clears throat> <clears throat> for solving PDEs with finite elements. And when we say high order, we consider both the extreme scale, so really high order, 8, 10, or really unlimited, uh, but also consider the low order case, order one, as a special case, and you'll see some of the work we're doing in this area. Uh, this includes unstructured MR, so meshes like this, and many, many target applications. So in the ECP, we're interested in compressible and incompressible flow, um, climate, uh, nuclear reactor modeling, additive manufacturing. Uh, but really, this team loves to work with applications. So if we have any application that you think can benefit from our technology, please reach out. We'd love to work with you. Mathematically, um, the, the work in this center is based on decomposing a finite element operator in number of pieces that expose the parallelism, the meshing, and the topology of the mesh, the basis, and then all the physics that you do at quadrature points. You will see this decomposition mentioned quite a few times. We call it the fundamental finite element decomposition or the Lipschitz decomposition. Uh, and it enables us by just storing, computing and storing data at quadrature points uh, to have basically optimal memory transfer and near optimal flops uh, to apply an operator. This is the matrix free um, version of the operator that we're talking about. Also, we call it partial assembly sometimes. And it enables other things like automatic differentiation that just transfers all the way down to quadrature points and uh, is much more efficient. Now we use that um, to develop kernels, um, and we have a number of benchmarks that we call uh, bake-off problems. Uh, they're called that because we, we use them to compare codes. Um, and we had a paper on this where a number of codes um, compared performance. And the, the plots that you see in these bake-off problems look something like this. Uh, this is problem size per, per node, uh, per core, uh, or per GPU. Um, and then you have throughput, so the number of degrees of freedom um, processed per second. Uh, of course, if you have a large problem size, you attain a certain maximum performance. Uh, and you can see on these kind of plots that um, higher orders perform better. We're, we're running a, a number of um, refinements, um, a number of MPI tasks, so we can compare different orders by the number of degrees of freedom. Uh, so this here is order two, for example, order one is not even here on this plot. Uh, and as you can see, order seven and eight here are much better. 
But in parallel, we're not just interested on the maximum performance we get on one core. We're interested in the efficiency we get. We want to use many cores, so we are willing to give up some of this. Um, and we're interested in the problem size where we get about 80% of the efficiency. Um, turns out this is what basically governs the time to solution. Um, it's also related to the serial portion of the algorithm. So for GPUs, um, that is uh, correlated with kernel launch times, for example, this T0. Uh, and so this problem size where we get 80% efficiency uh, is basically related to this T0, the, the, the kernel launch time, for example, for GPUs and the RMAX um, um, this way. Uh, and you want to control two of these things. You don't want to just control the RMAX. You want to control maybe RMAX and um, increase RMAX, but also decrease N sub 0 0.8, because that's what controls ultimately your runtime. OK, this, this allows us to develop a number of models. Uh, Tim has done this, and uh, maybe we'll show some of his in his talk. But even a simple model like this, uh, if you fit it with MATLAB, it, um, oh, Mathematica here, uh, it gives a very good prediction of um, the performance. And so in this in this uh, project, we, uh, we uh, not only want to demonstrate good performance, we want to good, demonstrate good performance for a small problem size as possible per task. Okay. So let me show you a few uh, benchmark results from just one of our application. So this is the NFM finite element library. Uh, in addition to NEC, this is the other um, flagship high level um, application from this project. Uh, and this is an example of uh, PP1, uh, the mass matrix on a V100 and MI100 that shows that we basically get a performance portable code with the same code base. We can get decent performance on both machines um, up to about four gigadoffs here. So billions of four billion degrees of freedom per second here. And one of the things that recently we have done is to improve this measure, this N sub 0 0.8, by basically shifting everything, all these curves to the left. This is the work of John Camier in Livermore. Uh, and this shift essentially by this formula gives you a, the, the same kind of shift in um, time to solution, so about 10 times faster. Now, this there's a lot of caveats here. This is still not parallel, so it doesn't really translate to this strong scaling, but it's um, by using extreme fusion and, and, and other tricks in this XFL kernels, we're able to significantly put the N sub 0 0.8 on V100. Uh, and then in addition to that, we also have kernels in MFM that uh, can take advantage of the tensor cores uh, in, in NVIDIA hardware in this case, but we are extending this to others. So this is some performance, again, four or five gigadops, um, four to four to six on A100. All right, these kernels are then used in applications. One of the target applications for MFAM is the marble code. Um, and here you can see some of its test problems. This is a triple point shock uh, wave problems in 3D um, where different machines, uh, the performance of different machines is compared, uh, including GPU and CPU machines. And this is a shape charge in 3D where you can see that with this partially assembled version uh, going even from full assembly to partial assembly on the CPU, you already get a lot. Uh, so this matrix film algorithm is already paying off. But when you go to the GPU, the speed up in different portions of the algorithm are, is substantial. And if you're interested in that, there will be uh, both uh, for um, uh, the MNSA ATDM applications on Thursday morning. And Marble is, is one of those that will be presented there with uh, uh, more updated and recent results. All right, so I just scratched the surface here. Um, I mentioned that uh, MFM and NEC 5000 and the new version NEC RS, uh, um, our high level libraries and applications we provide uh, from SID. We also have a low level library that is implementing um, essentially the action of this fundamental finite element decomposition, LibSID. So, Jet will talk about that. We've developed a number of mini apps. Um, NECBone is probably the one that you've heard about, and now Keybone, the version for AMD. Uh, Lagos is a mini app for Marble. Lipper Anumal is uh, Tim Orberton's code at Virginia Tech, where a lot of um, these cutting edge uh, optimizations uh, um, for uh, the new GPUs are performed. In terms of the benchmarks, I did mention the Bake Off problems. There's also a kernel version of that. 
uh, that is even um, uh, lower level, just the innermost loop. Uh, and recently we introduced Bake Off Problems for Solvers, BPS. You will see um, those mentioned too. Um, we have periodic distributions for the whole um, seed stack, including the mini apps, the different libraries and the applications. Uh, the most recent one is seed 5.0. That was part of a milestone that just got completed. And then um, there are many other things in the computational um, ecosystem for how the methods that, that we're working on. Uh, meshing is one of them. Uh, of course, performance, Oka is a library that uh, we use for um, low level performance portability. That's critical for Libranumal and NECRS. Uh, Magma is a GPU library for um, dense linear algebra that is also being uh, developed in this center. There's a lot of research topics um, that we're interested in, matrix free solvers, adaptive mesh refinement, automatic differentiation, visualization, and much more. Um, some of the folks uh, and their projects that are involved in the center are listed here. Uh, I believe all of them are here on the call and you can reach out to them. Uh, this is the email where you can reach out to us. This is the project website where you can learn quite a bit. And um, as I mentioned, uh, all of this is on GitHub. We have poster sessions. Um, this afternoon is the seat, the uh, poster in, in the AD poster session. And then on Thursday, a number of um, these projects, so MFM Magma, for example, have posters also in the software technologies uh, poster session. Um, and the other thing I will say is that in addition to our papers, um, we are pretty good at documenting our progress in milestone reports. I think we have something like 400 pages at, total of milestone reports. Uh, and you can find all of them. They're all available. Uh, we put them up as soon as we complete the milestones. Um, they're all available on our website. And they also have a DOI um, uh, through Zenodo. And just to give you an idea of what's in uh, one of these milestones, this is this is some highlights from the most recent ones. Um, uh, the most recent one is CDMS38. So there's a lot of, um, in that report, there's a lot of results on MI250X, on Crusher, um, all of these codes, um, as well as some applications. And this is some of the hip bone results that you will see in a second, um, the, the most latest ones, uh, comparing to some previous GPUs. There's a lot of um, research, or, or, or kind of um, new methods for matrix reconditioning. This includes new methods for assembling a low order refined system. This is how we precondition a hardware operator. Um, and the improvement here is dramatic, as you can see, from the old to the current new optimized batched uh, assembly method. Um, there are improvements on um, solvers in the applications, as well as uh, new interesting things like matrix free weblet preconditioning here. Um, and then there's just a lot of new and improved software. Um, Omega H is a meshing um, framework that is GPU enabled, that it, it, uh, its integration with MFAM was improved. Hipbone I mentioned. This kernel fusion work that I presented earlier from MFAM is in this report. Uh, these are some of the examples of test problems from the different applications from pebble bed reactors for NEC to nonlinear mechanics for Lipsit and electromagnetics for MFAM that are all in this report. So I'll encourage you to, to look at it if uh, any of this looks interesting. And the last thing I wanted to mention is that we are preparing to have an annual meeting. Um, this is going to be the sixth one for this project. And this time we're gonna to try to also meet in person. So it's gonna have a hybrid form. Um, if you're interested to come to um, the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign, um, we'll meet there August 9 to 11. Uh, and if you can't make it in person, but you're interested, please go to this link. Um, this is just our website and you will see it. 6 a.m. or you will just see the, the link to the to the meeting register and um, we'll also have um, a zoom uh, a zoom option for hybrid attendance. All right, so with that, that's all I wanted to show. Um, any questions? Comments? I know this was a little fast, apologize. We'll make those slides available. 
So I don't see chat. If there is anything in the chat, please let me know. Okay. Well, if there is not, then let me stop sharing. And we can just, uh, Tim, if you don't mind, we can just start early with you and give you a little bit more time. I think that would be great. Can everybody see my screen? I can see it. Yes. Can, great. Okay. So um, thank you, Zania. Zania has done a great job of setting the stage uh, for the seed uh, session. I'm going to talk about, as you mentioned, tuning um, seed kernels for, and my emphasis today is on very high order finite element kernels for the AMD GPUs in Frontier. This is work in very close collaboration with uh, Noel Chalmers and Damon McDougall at AMD. And I'd also like to call out Kasia Sverido, which is, I believe, on this call for her contributions early on to the original kernels that we've uh, started this work on. Uh, my team and our collaborators, in particular at Seed, have uh, created a, a, a sort of an ecosystem of uh, benchmarking tools, libraries, and uh, reference solvers for GPU accelerated uh, finite element solvers. Um, we use, at the bottom level, uh, we use our low level uh, portability layer called Arca. It's designed to fade into the background and make GPU coding easier. In fact, the the less you hear about it, the better. That essentially means if we don't complain about it, it must be working. Um, we have backends, uh, numerous backends, including an AMD HIP backend contributed by Noel Chalmers at AMD Research and a DPC++ backend contributed by Intel. So all the codes we're talking about today are uh, available for um, day one runs on Aurora and Frontier and are already being used on development systems. We have um, software built on top of Arca, including libparanormal, which is our performant portable high order finite element kernels and solvers. So um, that has quite a range of, of PDU solvers like uh, hyperbolic acoustics, uh, elliptic solvers, also incompressible and area stoke solvers, quite a range. Um, but today I'm actually gonna talk about our benchmarking tools, stream paranormal, which is tool for benchmarking high order finite element streaming operations and uh, Bench Paranormal, which is uh, built around the seed uh, BKs and BPs, the um, matrix vector products that Zanya mentioned, and uh, basic linear solvers. The lib Paranormal codes have been used as a, a sort of a foundation for some other codes, including NECRS, which you'll talk about, which you'll hear about later, and HipBone as well, which we'll talk about later. It's also found its way into industrial applications, including uh, code by Trouble Technologies. So let's get straight to it. Um, we use the, the stream paranormal benchmarking tool to, to help our understanding of um, basic memory throughputs, the expectation or what are our expectations for streaming data from um, HBM device memory. And sometimes these kernels can actually produce some interesting uh, feedback that we've provided to vendors um, in terms of um, when things are, uh, when streaming is not meeting expectations. But if we look at the performance of the uh, benchmark streaming, the, the BS tests, which we have simple tests like copy and axe, be a norm, a dot product, a fused contribute gradient vector update, um, we see that the MI250X on one GCD is delivering approximately 1.4 terabytes streaming throughput uh, compared to the, the, the manufacturer peak, which is a pretty good percentage, which is I think at 1.65 gigabytes per second. We estimate these uh, asymptotic throughputs using a simple linear model for the execution time, which is a remarkably good uh, model, and um, is, you can even can't, you can barely see the fit lines there. Um, um, if we move on to the uh, gather scatter and gather scatter operations, then you'll see that we do see some degradation in throughput. That's not entirely uh, that's rather expected given the random access of the finite element uh, gather and scatter operations, but. Um, those basic benchmarks are not quite sufficient to reflect or model the uh, throughputs that we might expect from seed benchmarks, seed uh, BKs, because typically they involve asymmetric read and write. So we typically, when we, when we apply our finite element operators, we, we perform many more reads than we perform writes. Could be a ratio of like eight to one or more. Um, 
depending on the specific benchmark. And um, well, we've added a new uh, BS test, BS9, which is uh, designed to measure asymmetric streaming, where uh, say a kernel, a thread in a kernel will, will um, excuse me, a kernel will say read one or uh, eight values, sum them up and write out one value. And you can see on the right that there's, there's a great deal of variability um, depending on the ratio of the number of reads, number of reads to the number of writes. And typically we're on the far right of this diagram, but if you look at the peak values for the streaming, we get peak streaming throughput when we have one read and one write per thread. Um, but it degrades as you increase the number of reads per write. And we can see that instead of getting about 13, one point, uh, 1,380 gigabytes per second throughput, the throughput can actually degrade to below um, 1.2 terabytes per second. And this will help us calibrate our expectations for the specific seed uh, bake-off kernels. So the, the bake-off kernels are uh, four represented, I've, I've, I've chosen four of the representative kernels. In fact, I've take, taken three and added an extra, um, which uh, represent the uh, computation, uh, we're computing um, L2 inner products using a, a, a GL producture. And if we look at the, uh, the sort of representation, you can see that it consists of a scattering operation where uh, threads in the thread block will scatter values um, um, from global storage into a local array, could be a shared array. Um, and then we'll perform a sequence of uh, tensor contractions where we'll do three directional interpolations, compute, um, we'll weight the result, and then we'll perform three directional um, or tensor product uh, projections. So that's a good prototype for a, a, a lot of finite, finite, finite element operations. Um, and as we go down the page, we get more uh, progressively more and more complicated and you can see we're chaining together a whole sequence of tensor contractions um, that do present some challenges when we increase the polynomial order. That's when the number of degrees of freedom in each direction and each, and each hexahedral element increases, then we can, uh, you can imagine that this, this is a, chal a challenge to implement efficiently on a GPU where we have uh, limited resources in local cache, local register space. So those are four of the targets I'm going to choose today uh, to talk about. Um, we can, without even coding anything up, um, we can estimate roughly how well these kernels should do in terms of floating point performance by examining their theoretical um, arithmetic intensity. And on the right-hand side, you can see for different uh, precisions and different kernels, you can see that the arithmetic intensity ranges from about 0.5 up to about 13. Um, if we look at this, the specs for the, uh, the target GPU, the AMD uh, 250X, you can see that um, given that we have an empirical throughput of about 1.2 terabytes per second from HBM and a peak vector floating point performance of about 24 teraflops and a peak matrix performance of about 48 teraflops, um, if we wanted to saturate the floating point units or the matrix units on, on these, on these um, AMD GPUs, we'd have to uh, get to about 20 or 40 flops per byte, depending on which instruction units we're using. So the, the seed kernels themselves are memory bound. They are not compute bound. However, um, they're not, it's not particularly easy to hit the memory bound limit. Um, for instance, we have a random access scatter operation at the start of the, uh, the thread block activities. Um, the arithmetic intensity only grows linearly with polynomial degree, but the amount of data per element grows cubically with the, the polynomial degree of the element. That means that as we go to higher and higher order, the, uh, the local data share pressure grows very fast, the register pressure grows very fast, and we can run into things like the LDS bandwidth or maximum bandwidth, which can limit performance. So um, at the end, we when we get to the higher degrees, we have a very large amount of data relative to the available uh, LDS and register file. So this makes this quite a challenging optimization activity. But we went through and we've optimized the, um, all of these BK 
all these all these uh, finite element operations. And on the left, I'm showing you for both double and single precision for each of the three benchmark problems, um, benchmark kernels, up to degree 15. If we focus on the BK3 and BK5, these kernels are by and large getting pretty much 900 to 1.1 terabytes per second throughput. There, there are some wrinkles though. Because of the high register pressure, higher LDS pressure, we, we actually offload some of the um, tense contractions to the matrix cores at higher order. In fact, the results shown in red are where we've uh, started to offload the uh, matrix, the, the, the uh, tense, some, of, some of the tense contractions to the matrix cores. And um, the BK5 is very well tuned. It's with, it's pretty close to the theoretical, well, not sorry, the empirical um, asymmetric streaming capability of the GPU. So whatever we do with the BK5s at higher order, we are not going to see much more improvement unless we start compressing some of the data. Uh, BK3, likewise, the performance is extremely high in terms of a percentage of peak asymmetric empirical throughput. And BK1 um, is a little bit different because um, in that case, we are running into some other limits um, in terms of what's, what's uh, limiting uh, the, the throughput. And part of that, is, it's a little uncertain because we don't have access to a good uh, profiling tool for this, but we're running into quite high um, floating point throughput rates. And um, on the AMD GPU, we can't overlap the integer instructions uh, for say indexing and the 32-bit uh, floating point instructions. So we're, we're probably instruction limited for some of these BK1 uh, examples. So those are the classic uh, seed bake-off kernels. Um, and I also would like to turn to a kernel that comes from NECRS, which we previously called BK7. This is an advection kernel. We're performing a, um, basically we're testing the um, nonlinear advection term that comes out of, in, uh, of an incompressible neighbor Stokes solver, in this case, NECRS. And this is a really nasty kernel because um, the typical requirement here is that we start with a degree n um, tense product element, which we then interpolate to a, a quadrature, which is of degree three over two. So we, we have 27 over eight times as much data once we've done the interpolation. And at very high order, that quickly actually, um, we have more data than can reasonably uh, be um, present on the, on the compute unit at any one time. So in order to uh, manage that sort of data, uh, data bomb there, we, we've very carefully partitioned the, um, the contractions, tense contractions into a sequence which minimizes the amount of data that's resident on the compute unit at any single time. And then we very carefully partitioned the work uh, between the vector units and the matrix units on, on the CU. Um, it's not that we're using the matrix cores uh, to accelerate the floating point operations specifically, but we're actually unlocking about half of the uh, registers that, half of the registers on, on the AMD uh, compute unit are locked away in the matrix cores. So we're actually just sort of taking, uh, taking advantage of that. And I also think we're reducing the amount of shared memory traffic. So to give you a sense of, of the, the progression in the optimization of these kernels, I've chosen a specific order with a specific quadrature. So this ends up with a 16 by 16 by 16 quadrature, which means you have a lot of data. And initially we started optimizing the vector cores. You can see we've got like on the right hand side, you can see 28 kernels. Um, the first 15, actually first 19 kernels were um, just using the vector cores. We only really started um, unlocking uh, better throughput when we engage the matrix cores at kernel 20 and above. And eventually we're able to get about uh, 850 gigabytes per second for this kernel, which is um, uh, the best I've seen for any GPU for this specific um, um, kernel. And there's a whole lot of standard and non-standard optimizations that we've applied uh, to get these numbers. So we can look at the throughput. Um, and we look at the floating point throughput for one GCD on an AMD uh, 250, NI250X. And we can see that um, 
well, I'll, I'll, I'll confess something, which is we, we didn't do, we didn't, um, we don't have the best uh, utilization of the, uh, the matrix cores. We've got a fairly naive implementation at, at the moment. We're hoping we'll increase the floating point performance at some point soon. Um, it's not entirely trivial to do that because the matrix operations we need to do don't neatly map into the available matrix operations that are available in the matrix intrinsics. But once we've, um, at sufficiently high order, um, the matrix instruction versions of the kernels can significantly outperform the um, uh, vector only versions of the kernels up until a point where we um, don't have a good match between the size of the um, matrix operations and the available um, matrix instructions. So you can see that with the matrix instructions, we can get to well above uh, five um, teraflops performance and even up to um, uh, seven teraflops in double precision and about nine teraflops in, in single precision. These, these kernels are very much a work in progress, but um, they, they do give us some confidence that uh, with some uh, further work, we'll be able to uh, improve the performance for um, higher order elements. And if we actually look at the, because we have a fairly uh, inefficient use of the matrix um, units, the matrix cores, we can actually see that uh, the codes are doing pretty well. They're uniformly getting kind of getting between five teraflops and nine teraflops. It's just that at low order, we're doing a lot of uh, padding instructions, which aren't particularly useful. So just to wrap it up, um, we've used the stream paranormal uh, codes to calibrate our throughput expectations for the MI250X. We've added a benchmark, which BS9, which highlights the performance variations uh, for asymmetric streaming. That was very important because we needed to understand when to stop optimizing. And for um, the BK1, 3, and 5, we're at the point, at least for 3 and 5, where we know we should stop optimizing. We've hit the um, throughput that we can expect for this GPU for at least one GCD. Um, our kernels are very much memory bound. Um, they're highly, highly optimized now for the MI250X. And um, we had to use the um, AMD MI200 ISA matrix instructions, uh, matrix in intrinsics at high order to unlock the, um, the matrix uh, vector registers um, in order to keep going to higher and higher order and maintaining throughput. We've achieved a high percentage of peak empirical asymmetric HBM streaming throughput from BS9. And we can get between six and 10 teraflops, depending on precision. And these kernels will be released in hip bone, bench paranormal, and leg paranormal in the near future. And our to-do list is to improve the matrix instruction, instruction usage as we're um, a little bit sloppy at the lower orders when we're using the matrix instructions. Um, also, in terms of NECRS, we've done kernel optimization, not shown, but we've also optimized, I think, three of the under, underperforming kernels. And I showed you the um, optimization of the advection kernel, which is tuned up for both the A100 and the MI250X. And we've achieved high performance at high order despite large elemental data footprints. And this will, at least the vector version, will be shipped with the upcoming NECRS release. And then Everything I've talked about would not be possible without the close collaboration with Noel Chalmers and Damon McDoodle of AMD Research. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Great talk. I'm looking at chat. So one question there is, are the slides going to be available? Yes, we will make the slides available. Uh, certainly. Any questions for Tim? Tim, Tim, I have a question. Mm -hmm. On your asymmetric uh, bandwidth metric, sorry if you can go back to that slide. Yeah, I'll bring it up. Uh, there we go. Yeah. I was just, what, yeah, I'm trying to understand. Is when you say throughput, is that the total in and out or how or yeah, total in and out. Okay. So if you're just doing a one-to-one, -one, it would be just a standard copy, right? 
So, um, so, so would I expect it to just drop down to a half as that ratio goes to infinity or uh, to zero? In other words, all no, in or all no. out? No, if it's all in or all out, you're very likely to get the full uh, throughput. But what I think is going on here is that, um, and I have not had confirmation on this, is there is some overhead for bus turnaround. Uh, okay, so, so I, okay. I'll, I'll reveal my total ignorance. I always thought these things were fully duplexed and, and that in and out didn't matter, but maybe that's a, maybe I'm thinking about a different network. I'm going to have to defer to AMD folks who can maybe shed some light on this. I mean, okay. yeah, it's a it's a bidirectional bus. So I guess the way I would ex I, I would explain that in this plot, where the x-axis is moving to the left, means fewer reads uh, per write you're doing, um, mm -hmm. and further to the right means more reads per write. Uh, so if you went infinitely to the left, you would be at pure write bandwidth. If you went infinitely to the right, you'd be at the pure read bandwidth. Mm -hmm. Both of those should be pretty near the peak. I think write on the MI GPUs is slightly slower. Read is usually a, a fairly good fraction of peak, 85% or higher of the peak HBM bandwidth. So that's sort of what I would expect. It's this interesting mix uh, that uh, Professor Warburton, Warburton is showing here that will have to include things like the bus turnaround when there's a, a certain percentage of, re of requests coming into the memory controller are read requests and some large or small percentage of that are write requests. Got That's it. been the case on other GPUs as well, in my experience. And indeed, usually the highest performance would be for pure reads, uh, pure writes. I don't think I've seen anywhere that it's the same. It's 10, maybe a bit more lower um, than that for pure writes. And then the the mix of reads and writes is somewhere in, in between, or sometimes even worse than pure writes, um, as would be the case here. Right. And this is what we needed to, qua to quantify so we could understand if we were at a reasonable throughput limit. Yeah. So all we cared about here was whether we could stop integrating, not stop integrating, stop optimizing. And at this point, when we're at about over 1.1 terabytes per second, we know we're pretty much done. Right. So, so if I, if we have a time for one more question, Tim, um, I think so. So, again, it may show my age, but when I was running these calculations with you back in the '90s, uh, usually production runs were not done at polynomial order over twelve. Usually, they were like seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. uh, corresponding to an n one more than that. So the, the sweet spot is a bit below where you seem to be getting the benefit from the uh, matrix units right now. And we're not far away from peak at those levels either. Okay. So that's that's a but place it, where it, the vector it, units are doing well. So my, my vision for this is um, in most boundary methods and other methods where they want to go high order with some geometry through other means. But, but this is a valid point. There are applications that uh, even interested in lower orders and you'll see like three four you'll hear some of those too but as you can see we've we've hit a pretty decent percentage of that peak through all of those orders right that's the point of this but in order to get to the highest degree we had to do something different the interesting thing to me is the uh what's sort of maybe not clear in the mi200 iso manual is that this uh four by four by four 64-bit uh, matrix instruction isn't actually running at the accelerated rate. Um, there are other 64-bit matrix instructions that run at uh, two times the flop per clock uh, that normal FP64 rate is on the MIT50X. This is not one of them. This is running at the normal FP64 FMA rate. Um, however, the benefit seems to be here that we take a lot of pressure off of the shared memory fabric. Yeah. Um, and, and that's been our that's been our Achilles heel for a lot of these very high order kernels. And, and I think in principle, then, with more complicated kernels doing much more sort of compute on the CU level, um, things like the nonlinear advection subcycling kernel that Professor Robertson talked about, there, there's maybe a more intermediate benefit there just to relieve LDS pressure. And I think with some more time, 
we're on a fairly short deadline for this, I think we'll be able to push these matrix calls down to the lower orders where it maybe is more relevant to more folks. That's right. All right, thank you. Thank you again, Tim. Um, let's switch to the next talk. Um, Noel, are you ready? Uh, I think so. Let me juggle some windows and share. We can continue these discussions if we have time at the end also. All right, so next talk is going to be Noel um, and Damon from AMD, and they're going to talk about Hipbone, a new um, version of Neckbone C++ port for AMD. Uh, yeah, and I, I will assume that most people here are fairly familiar with, uh, with Neckbone, or at least heard it in passing. Um, and it shouldn't be any surprise that AMD is interested in it as part of the Coral 2 effort. Um, so I'm going to try to condense, unfortunately, what I uh, what I can't do particularly well with AMD slide decks is uh, is omit some details. Um, we like to be a bit detail oriented, but that means I have more slides than I have minutes to talk. So I'll I'll try to be terse um, and not trespass on the time of of the uh, other speakers. So I've got a few things to go over, uh, namely, what is Hipbone? Effectively, how is it similar to Neckbone? How is it different to Neckbone? What are some of the things we did for uh, implementation core changes of the Neckbone benchmark? How did we sort of design it more towards these modern high throughput accelerators? And what were the, some of the optimizations and performance changes we made? And then finally, well, what I think is a kind of interesting data point, we've seen a lot of uh, focus from Professor Warburton's talk on looking at single GPU accelerators uh, or single kernel invocations on single GPU accelerators. And uh, Neckbone, as well as now Hipbone, are uh, meant to be these sort of high scaling, uh, fill a whole uh, supercomputing cluster kind of um, uh, beauty mark benchmarks, I like to think of them. Uh, and uh, and that's what we're going to show in, in this talk is some scaling studies on Summit for NVIDIA's V100 GPUs. Uh, and then the Spock and Crusher uh, development clusters at Oak Ridge um, for MI100s and MI250X GPUs. So what is Hipbone? Uh, well, uh, it's open source. We have a, a preprint that's out that goes over a lot of the details. Um, it was developed uh, in a close collaboration with Professor Warburton at Virginia Tech, as well as Abhishek Mishra, a, uh, a PhD student in uh, SUNY Buffalo. Um, I have a note here from Damon that says I should stress that Hipbone is a, you could say, a joint collaboration. Um, thank you, Damon, for contributing that to my notes. Uh, it's not a complete port of Neckbone. It uh, is missing some, I would say, very crucial computational uh, ingredients. Uh, for example, the preconditioner, just not existent in Hipbone currently. Um, we focus just on the individual CG iteration. Uh, why is Neckbone important? Well, it's a proxy application for the pressure solve inside of the NEC 5000 CFD app. And much like uh, NECRS has been this uh, modern C++ implementation of uh, the core NEC 5000 algorithm, uh, we're sort of thinking of Hipbone as a kind of proxy for NECRS in a similar way. Uh, it, it's again e a proxy for the pressure solve, uh, much like in in NECRS, and it kind of gives us a playground to investigate the performance on different uh, hardware across different vendors, as well as different algorithmic uh, implementations. Um, and obviously, as NECBONE is a Coral 2 problem, uh, there's a vested interest at AMD to make sure it uh, performs well and, uh, and scales well up to exascale. So what was our starting point? Uh, well, uh, if you go check out the NECBONE GitHub repo, uh, you'll notice it's a Fortran code, uh, much like NEC 5000. And uh, that makes things difficult to, uh, to get GPU support in a what I would think of as a, a low level uh, sandboxy kind of way. You're really uh, bound to things like OpenMP offload or OpenACC support, um, which are heavily relying on your compiler to essentially do the right thing. And these finite element kernels can be quite complex. We do a lot of things like uh, leveraging a lot of shared memory or being very particular about where we put uh, data inside of registers. 
um, in the kernel code. And, and we don't have a lot of flexibility with OpenMP or OpenACC to do these things. Um, when thinking about scaling up, Neckbone uh, uses a, a library called, uh, called GSLib to do its uh, complex uh, gather scatter uh, finite element operations. Uh, this is a, a C code. It's written purely with MPI. Um, and we'd like to bolt in things like uh, GPU support into this library and leverage all of its uh, uh, nice communication algorithms uh, that it can uh, run at, at setup time and then pick the fastest exchange protocol. Uh, but it's, uh, again, uh, not as, as uh, severe as with the Fortran, but it's still uh, not clear how to directly inject things like HIP or CUDA support uh, or even just threading uh, into the design of that. So uh, that was our starting point. We thankfully, thanks to the, uh, the SEED uh, co-design center, uh, have a lot of uh, research and, uh, and development effort that's been made by uh, many researchers and developers across several institutions. And we, and we got to, we had the luxury of being able to leverage that. Uh, and in particular, Neckbone's computation is very similar to uh, what uh, Sanyo and, and Tim have described was the, the, the bake-off problem number five, uh, this um, diffusion kernel where the quadrature order is the same as your uh, Lagrange interpolation basis. Uh, and so we could essentially start from several uh, BP5 implementations and, uh, and, and run from there. And we picked, probably no surprise considering I was one of the original developers, uh, uh, bench paranormal as the BP5 implementation to start from and then uh, work our way towards how do we optimize this for AMD hardware and, and other uh, modern GPU vendors. Um, at its core, it's, it's just lib paranormal's core libraries, things like mesh wrangling uh, and halo exchange, uh, finite element operator uh, construction, things like that are just, just come, are lifted from lib paranormal. And we took uh, bench paranormal's BP5 operator uh, so that, that Tim described earlier as a starting point. And we also use Akka for portability. This is a, a just-in-time compilation abstraction model which let us, lets us leverage uh, uh, optimizations at JIT time from knowing things like loop bounds and being able to smartly unroll without having to rely on heuristics inside of our compiler. Uh, and it, it uh, gives us portability to several hardware vendors. So that's why I'm going to show not just results from, from AMD hardware, but also uh, uh, NVIDIA's U100s. And then it's, it's a very lightweight, uh, benchmark other than that. We require a CPU BLAS library just for setup and obviously MPI. So what are the main differences uh, with Neckbone's original implementation and what Hipbone does? Essentially, how did, we, how did we choose to do things differently to try to maximize performance on GPU accelerators? Well, Neckbone holds its problem in what C terminology is uh, labels the E vector, where degrees of freedom although they are being uh, shared by neighboring elements are replicated inside of the solution degree of freedom vector. Um, this lets your operator evaluation be, be uh, very efficient uh, because essentially you can read and write uh, chunks of elements in completely coalesced fashion. Uh, you won't have any uh, scattered loads, scattered stores, things like that. Um, and you can put the entirety of your communication uh, in a single gather scatter step. So you, you do the local operator evaluation on the e vector, your result is an e vector, and then you just need to sum up uh, the contributions at each of the repeated degrees of freedom and scatter those sums contributions back to each of their locations in an e vector. Um, that's very good for latency. Uh, your MPI uh, gather scatter exchange is essentially done in one, in one blast and, uh, and it's done. You don't have to communicate several times. Um, however, if you even just look in this picture from 2D quad, uh, quadrilateral elements, um, holding the degrees of freedom in the E vector uh, results in a lot of data replication. Um, it ends up that you, if you hold all of your vectors in the hip or in the neckbone benchmark in this form, uh, you have a significantly higher uh, amount of data motion to just do even things like the congea gradient. Um, iterations and, and it can be severe. It can be upwards of 40%, even uh, around 20 something percent uh, data overhead 
uh, at very high order, like uh, n equals 15. Uh, so one of the things we did was to switch to essentially an assembled uh, vector with with all the data, with all the degrees of freedom replication squeezed out in a sense. Um, and this is in C terminology called a T vector. Uh, this, of course, as I as I mentioned, uh, the nice thing about operating on E vectors in Neckbone was that all of your communication, your your major nearest neighbor uh, communication was done in the single gather scatter exchange. Uh, and we require now two exchanges because we operate on a T vector. Uh, we require uh, doing a kind of halo exchange in order to get uh, degrees of freedom in elements that are not stored locally. Um, essentially, you have a partial element being held on a process, and you need to get some of those nodes from a neighboring process. And then we need to do the actual assembly. We need to gather back from an E vector to a T vector which it requires another uh, uh, MPI communication. Um, but we de detail a lot about how we've split up the operator eval uh, evaluation uh, in the Poisson kernel to uh, allow us to try to at least maximally hide these two uh, MPI communication phases. Um, in order to, to give you some of the details, I'm going to try to maybe breeze through this, but some of the details are that we have to label uh, what elements will require communication. They're essentially interprocessor boundary elements. And moreover, what individual degrees of freedom are being shared between uh, two processors. So uh, this diagram uh, shows at least that kind of taxonomy, uh, where the, the shaded red elements are elements that will require some kind of MPI communication. And the red nodes themselves are nodes that need to be sent or received uh, in such a communication pattern. Um, with that, we uh, split our operator evaluation into several different steps to try to collect up MPI messages, send moot data around, and uh, keep the device busy uh, computing through uh, local elements. So we start by, by packing our, our uh, halo data to begin our halo exchange. Um, we then queue uh, what would be a fairly large kernel if the device is saturated, but a kernel that would compute half of the, half of the interior elements, not the entire uh, processor interior, but only half of them. Um, while that kernel's spinning, we do our uh, MPI halo exchange. Finally, when that uh, when all the messages have been received, we return uh, unpacking that halo data, and we're ready to compute the local operator valuation on all of the halo elements. And we do that. We do that immediately. Uh, when that's done, we begin the gather step, uh, even though our interior still hasn't been fully computed in the local operator valuation. We immediately start gathering up the message for the next MPI exchange. Um, once that's been uh, collected up into, uh, into buffers, we, we then complete the local action of the uh, Poisson kernel and queue the local gather, which should be ready to go at this point, uh, since all the elements have been uh, have had the local Poisson action completed. And finally, uh, use those two kernels to hide our second MPI exchange. Um, and finally unpack the result that we received from the, uh, the direct summation. Um, I mentioned before that uh, Nick, Neckbone's original code uses gslib for this. Uh, we had a, an excellent co-op student uh, named Abhishek Mishra from SUNY Buffalo uh, come in for a term uh, uh, at AMD to work on uh, an implementation of this uh, that could leverage GPU-aware MPI. Um, and we have essentially a new uh, device-aware gather, scatter, or dogs library because uh, I, I had a lot of time to come up with acronyms. And, uh, and we use this technology uh, to write a essentially a, a GSLib replacement. It's a multi-threaded uh, gather, scatter library that does the same kinds of pairwise or all-to-all -all or crystal router algorithms and picks the fastest at runtime. But it can also do things like each of the local uh, uh, scattered loads or stores, the, the local gather uh, operators themselves are multi-threaded, or they are offloaded to the GPU uh, using Akka. And that could be, of course, to any of the supported backends in Akka. Um, finally, uh, Tim's talked a lot about performance. Uh, I won't go too too deeply other than to say that stream performance is fairly well understood to us as part of the, the paranormal suite. Uh, and the local Poisson operator kernel uh, we obviously spent a lot of time uh, looking at the optimization of this, starting from 
a lot of the work that was done in CUDA by uh, Kaja Swedovic. Um, Tim showed a lot of the matrix core uh, uh, results. I'm not going to talk about those in, in this. Instead, I'm going to use essentially a common code base between CUDA and HIP uh, and the different models of the MIGPUs that don't have the FP64 matrix cores and just show essentially what is the portable performance of the HIP bone benchmark today. Um, oh, and I remember I, I, I threw this in for fun. So on a fairly large problem, this is an eight node hip bone run on, on Crusher. Uh, you can see the different phases of the computation in each of the CG iterations. There's uh, that first collection is the Poisson action that I just went over. You can see the, the gaps in the timeline here coming from the, the rock profiler. Uh, it's not annotated, but those are essentially the MPI exchanges. You can see them being very well hidden by local kernels. This is a pretty large problem. Um, I think about uh, 15 million degrees of freedom per GPU. Um, and then the vector operations for the rest of the CG iteration are, are well, they're just normal streaming. So uh, I won't uh, str stress too much of the details of the system. I include these for completeness, uh, but we considered the uh, Summit supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Lab consists of uh, six V100 accelerators per node and a single uh, InfiniBand EDR NIC. Uh, we considered the Spock cluster at ORNL, uh, which is a single epic processor with a, a slingshot 10 interconnect and uh, and four MI100 accelerators. And finally, you can see the node diagram getting increasingly more complex as we add more accelerators, but the Crusher testbed at ORNL was our final uh, uh, system that we we're considering for scaling. And it consists of four MI250Xs, which themselves consist of two uh, graphics compute die or GCDs. Um, and each one of these MI250Xs are directly attached to a Slingshot 11 interconnect uh, NIC. And for completeness, these are the software that, that was used for each of these tests. So uh, in terms of just the local plus on kernel performance, uh, we calibrate an empirical roof line using the BS9 test that uh, Professor Warburton detailed before, an 8 to 1 read to write ratio streaming kernel that does effectively no compute. And we use that to give a, a roof line model of where we would expect peak performance of these kernels to be on each of the accelerators if we were hiding compute purely behind streaming. Uh, and you can see that uh, with the exception perhaps of the dip of the MI100 uh, after order 10, we track fairly well to the uh, empirical streaming limit. And in fact, if we were to use the 64-bit uh, uh, matrix core operations on the MI250X, we would actually snap those last few percent back up to the, uh, to the roof line uh, on the single GCD MI250X. In terms of scaling, I show on the right here, uh, on the left for a summit, uh, several uh, multi-node runs of HipBone up to 48 V100 accelerators over eight nodes uh, at degree 15, because why not? That gives us the most gigaflops. And uh, we get up to, I believe in this plot, we're, we're somewhere on the order of, uh, some, I think below, maybe about 40 teraflops on these 48 GPUs. In, in overall uh, performance. And the more normalized throughput uh, that, that Sonia detailed very well uh, at the beginning of this session uh, shows that uh, when we normalize over the uh, degrees of freedom per rank and over the, uh, the actual number of ranks so that all the curves collapse down to a throughput plot, um, we see ourselves being fairly throughput limited, latency limited on the left side of this uh, graph. And then finally, uh, scaling up to a flat saturated section uh, of performance. And we can see the impact of, incre of scaling as the, the middle part is, is moving down as we get more and more uh, penalized by MPI latency in that uh, middle scaling section. On Spock, which, oh, apparently I just skipped right down. Um, on Spock, we see a similar thing, a similar kind of uh, performance uh, graph to what we saw on Summit, uh, this time reaching uh, up to 32 MI100 accelerators over eight nodes, uh, getting around, uh, I think, 30 uh, 30-ish uh, teraflops overall. Uh, and we see the similar characteristic of uh, a single device, the blue curve on the, on the right, showing very good performance all the way through, but then the middle section of the throughput uh, plots being more penalized by latency in the middle, but still reaching saturation around uh, uh, 10 million degrees of freedom 
uh, per GPU. And finally on Crusher, thanks to uh, significantly more uh, injection bandwidth uh, on each node. And, uh, and I, I think just maybe a smaller cluster in general, um, having a nice uh, uh, tight uh, latency scores right now. Uh, we reach, uh, I, I believe it's 68 teraflops uh, total. Um, and uh, on 64 uh, ranks, so that would be 64 GCDs or 32 MI250 acceler 250X accelerators uh, across eight uh, nodes. And we see a very tight clustering of the throughputs uh, on the right plot showing that uh, effectively once you're communicating off node on Crusher for small node counts like these, there's not too, too much uh, extra penalty because um, likely we're we're still inside of say the same dragonfly groups. Um, so to sum up, uh, we we carefully track the performance of the uh, the the sort the highest compute kernel inside of Hipbone, the, the local Poisson operator. Um, we track very close to empirical rooflines uh, for all three of these accelerators using effectively the same code base uh, and just re leveraging the portability that Aka gives us. Um, we can get up to in the kernel itself about 2.1 teraflops on a V100, slightly above that on an MI100, and uh, 2.78 teraflops without the matrix core acceleration that Professor Warburton talked about on a single GCD of the MI250X. Um, we're nearly entirely memory bound uh, through the whole uh, range of polynomial orders. Um, but at the high polynomial orders, we can see that without these uh, matrix cores, we start hitting uh, difficulty mapping the kernel well to the hardware because of uh, increased register pressure and, and corresponding drops in occupancy. And finally, once we are scaling on these clusters, at least for these small node counts, uh, admittedly modest, uh, we can get very good weak scaling efficiency moving. Once we're sort of communicating on the network and scaling up to, in this case, eight nodes, we can have uh, in the high 90s weak scaling efficiency for large enough problems. Um, and with that, uh, thanks, everybody. I just want to remind you that the Hipbone is open source. Contributions are are very much welcome. We we love feedback and and questions. Um, and uh, our goal of this is not just to show uh, AMD performance, but also just to give a kind of portable solution that hopefully will work across vendors and help with the effort in general uh, for for Coral Two. And uh, and with that, I, I will pause for for any questions. Thank you very much, Noel. This was really, really impressive stuff. Um, we're running a little bit behind, so maybe one quick question, if anybody has it. If nobody else has, has a very quick question, uh, at what point do you uh, lose the ability to hide communications, communications? How many elements per GPU do you arrive at the point that you can't hide the um, computations behind the communication behind computations. Right. And so that that can be seen in these throughput. So it's the strength of these uh, these sort of normalized throughput plots. Uh, I might be a little bit cherry picking here on the crusher test just because they look really nice. <laughs> but it's it's uh it's it's you can see that in the throughput the flat region, the sort of saturated uh, device um, region on the on the right side is where adding more degrees of freedom per GPU, adding more elements per GPU isn't really getting you your answer any faster. You are, you're, you're, you're bound to your streaming bandwidths, you're hiding your communication, nothing's really getting uh, any faster. But as you move to the left, and I think in this case, uh, I don't have this as elements per rank, but you can see it, it's probably around, uh, this is a log log plot, so maybe around uh, 5 million uh, degrees of freedom per element for this uh, n equals 15 case. Or sorry, degrees of freedom per per GPU. That's around where you're maybe eighty percent of your throughput, and so there's some communication overhead there, um, but you're hiding a good deal of it. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but essentially you can see the range of how much communication is penalizing your performance in these throughput plots. Okay, thank you. No worries. Thanks again, uh, Noel, and uh, yeah, we can maybe follow up. Uh, um, in chat. Uh, let's switch now to Jed, though, because um, uh, we are a bit behind. Jed, can you share, please? 
All right, I can see it. All right, cool. Uh, All right. Take care, no, right? Yep. Cool. Um, so I'm here to give you a tour of kind of the other end of things, um, really low order problems uh, or problems that were conventionally solved with uh, low order methods and uh, hopefully give you a story about why you should care about this. Um, an alternate title here is Constants Matter. So uh, we'll see this in two different ways. Um, so first of all, what are we doing? This is uh, like large deformation Neohookian uh, elastic model that I'm using as a test. These are extruded Schwartz P surfaces. This just makes a really nice solvers benchmark um, because it, you increase the size of this problem by increasing all dimensions of this cube. So you have lots of geometric complexity and you can keep it uh, roughly like the resolution that you would need to reach your target accuracy rather than refining to have way more accuracy than you need on a maybe simpler model. Um, so the results I'll show go out to uh, like 40 replicas of these um, surfaces in each dimension. Anyway, um, if we look at the current industrial state of practice for uh, uh, hyperelastic modeling, particularly large deformation, it's to use low order finite element methods. You'll often see like Q1 hexes or P2 tets, assembled matrices, and either sparse direct or algebraic multigrid solvers. And there's kind of two myths justifying this, and myths aren't any good if they're not half true. Um, but it, uh, first is high order doesn't really help because real problems have singularities. The truth there is real problems do have singularities and those won't be uh, properly resolved. Um, but that's life, that's fine. And high order methods still frequently help. And also that matrix free methods are just for high order problems. And it, it turns out that, well, we may have thought that for a while, um, for elasticity on Q1 hexes, you can have about a 2x benefit using uh, the matrix free representations. So first of all, industrial models are just completely riddled with singularities. So every reentrant corner in this sort of a model is going to have a stress singularity. And um, also any transition between like a Dirichlet to Neumann boundary condition. So the classic kind of mathematician's way to approach this is, well, you need HP adaptive finite elements because we really want to be able to get geometric convergence. And you make these plots of error versus number of degrees of freedom on a say log log scale. And you want that over on the right, it kind of curves down. Here's the problem. Frequently enough, we don't care about that so much. Um, we can reach a target accuracy without these extremely refined meshes. So here's an example um, of one of these kinds of HP adaptive meshes. And you see you get very small elements around each of these corners, um, but it allows you to get geometric convergence. But it, you look over in the real world and you've got moderately coarse elements, um, potentially large deformations. And so we're gonna look at this model on the right and we're going to compare accuracy. Um, and we'll do different meshes for that kind of model and different order elements. And we'll look at the errors. So uh, over here, we've got a, a classic method. So that would get you points like this. This is just normal low order methods, H refinement. Um, and it is true that the high order methods don't converge at any steeper slope. However, constants matter. So when you move from that high order, sorry, from this uh, linear element to a quadratic element, even though this problem has lots of singularities, you can still uh, predict in this case strain energy, but um, you can still predict that with much better accuracy than corresponding uh, low order methods. So every time you H refine, you kind of get on the same slope. Um, and P refinement doesn't give you anything like geometric convergence, but it does tend to give you better convergence. Now, there's a caveat here. If you keep your geometry fixed and you have these 
kind of reentrant corners, and you can see them lighting up here. We're plotting strain energy density. You, along these curves, uh, you can see these kind of weak reentrant corners give you strain singularities. Um, and so you really need at least a quadratic geometry to make these kinds of spurious artifacts go away and make it so you can stay on this kind of nicely converging refinement path rather than the one up here. But we see pretty consistently when we do these kinds of studies that we get the best accuracy by choosing almost the coarsest mesh that can resolve the geometry and then going to quadratic cubic elements, something on um, this goes up to uh, fourth order elements. The blue mesh here is just starting from a, an even coarser base mesh than the, uh, than the uh, gold mesh here. Um, so you might look at this and say, yeah, okay, but those quadratic and cubic elements cost a lot more to solve. And that's true if you use assembled sparse matrices. And in fact, the way that we solve these kinds of models, the opposite is true. So this figure is kind of generous to the lowest order methods and uh, it, the high order methods are kind of cheaper than you would appear, cheaper per degree of freedom. Um, so why do we do things matrix free? It's basically, we are looking for the most compact memory representation because everything these days is memory bound. Um, and the reason for that is the trend in hardware has been that uh, you can do many more flops per byte of memory bandwidth. And the curves here that drop down are the matrix free representations. The curves here that go up are the uh, assembled matrix representations. So let's look here. We're going to assemble this model on that extruded Schwartz P surface. We set up reasonably large models. This is running on uh, Lassen. And we look at the efficiency. So this is measured in uh, billions of degrees of freedom per second per GPU. And all of the blue lines here are using the matrix free representation. The gold lines here are using assembled sparse matrices. And these round dots are for the linear elements. That's the Q1 elements. And you can see about a factor of two benefit to using the uh, unassembled, the libseed style data structures over assembled matrices. And then there's the trend. If you go to higher order, you go to quadratic or cubic elements, then things get more efficient when you use libseed data structures and they get worse if you use assembled sparse matrices. A little performance model here, you can see um, that this is using the uh, QSparse for the matrix vector products here. And uh, it achieves close to the stream's bandwidth. So kind of the rightmost of these points is representative of the stream's bandwidth peak. Um, so you're not gonna do a lot better than that. Um, so the basic algorithm that we use here is matrix free on the fine levels. So that's using all the, the libc data structures. And we do assemble a coarse model and we pass that off to algebraic multigrid. In this case, we're using hyper uh, boom or AMG. And the general structure here is you're gonna have a nonlinear residual evaluation. So that's gonna use some geometry. It's gonna use your solution state. It produces an F of U. And it also caches some information at quadrature points that allow you to have a cheap action of the Jacobian, um, which is then used within the solver. It's used when you need to assemble. Um, and it, it, this allows you to amortize a lot of costs that are sometimes hard to amortize otherwise. Um, if you look at the cost breakdown using Q2 elements, you see about two thirds of the time is, set, is uh, inside of the solve doing preconditioner application. So doing smoothing, doing uh, coarse solves. Um, and the other uh, kind of major fraction of this is preconditioner and uh, setup and Jacobian assembly. Um, the preconditioner setup and Jacobian assembly is uh, a large share of that is within the algebraic multigrid. And that's on a problem that's about eight times smaller 
than the uh, course grid that we work with. So let's look at end-to-end -end efficiencies here. So we're sweeping over a bunch of different models. The blue curves here are Crusher, the red are on Perlmutter, um, and then the uh, green and gold are on uh, Lassen and Summit. So these top lines on Crusher are using one node. Um, the rightmost point here is 184 million degrees of freedom. Um, I think it's a little bit bigger over here on the right. The dotted line here is running on eight nodes. That's about a 1.5 billion degree of freedom model. Um, and this sort of slight drop over here um, is really just because this model happened to need an, one extra Newton iteration to converge over there. But this is an end-to-end -end nonlinear analysis. It takes uh, six Newton iterations typically. Um, and so we're getting uh, kind of 0.7, uh, so like 700,000 degrees of freedom per second per GPU. And that scales with uh, you know, maybe 20% loss of efficiency or so as you go to multiple nodes. And there's a fairly similar story when you use Q3 elements. This is relatively independent of the um, element order. If we look specifically at the linear solve efficiency, then uh, Perlmutter kind of pulls a, a head of, um, of Crusher there. And we're seeing our best models. Um, the linear solves are uh, kind of in the 2 million degree of freedom per second range uh, per GPU. So you have, say, four GPUs on Perlmutter. Um, that means you're going to have a couple of seconds. Uh, this is across all six of the solves. So if you kind of work this out, you're getting um, each linear solve takes uh, one to two seconds um, and at, at a rate of uh, around what, 12 um, million degrees of freedom per second per GPU. Um, qualitatively similar story with Q3 elements. The preconditioner setup is the opposite story. Um, so Crusher does really well there. Preconditioner setup is quite cheap. Um, again, this is summed over all the Newton iterations. Um, that story looks uh, fairly similar with Q2 and Q3 elements. To put this in a little bit of historical context, um, there were a, a couple of years, uh, around 20 years ago, that. Um, Gordon Bell special prizes went for solid mechanics. And so we, uh, the results that I'm showing, um, running on one node of Crusher, we have um, these models, say 184 million degrees of freedom, Q2 elements. It's the full nonlinear analysis. Um, this figure is actually a static linear analysis. The one on the right, um, this is over a number of loading increments. It's a nonlinear analysis. Um, these models, this is 110 million degrees of freedom. So these are not like straight one-to-one -one comparisons. I don't want to uh, sort of misrepresent what's going on here. But it, these are problems of the scale that was a Gordon Bell Prize, a batch submission running for at least several minutes. Um, and now it's something you could do interactively on a workstation. Um, so it's all built on libseed. Um, libseed gives you an interface. Um, in this case, uh, our library for solving these kinds of problems uses Petsy and libseed. Um, we get over to the uh, NVIDIA and AMD GPUs. A lot of cool features in libseed. Um, and so roughly speaking, the, the take home message here, you can move from Q1 to Q2 elements for about 2x cost. It's 8x more degrees of freedom, but it only costs you about 2x what you would have paid for the methods you use today on the Q1 models. Um, the consequences for meshing is that you want to choose roughly the coarsest mesh that you can find that resolves the geometry, and then p-refine to get to the accuracy that you need, whatever your engineering tolerance is. Um, the data structures in libseed are not just for high order. So even for linear elements, you can get a 2x benefit on operator application. There's a lot of consequences to that when we look within our solver stack and say, what, you know, what can we possibly do? Um, it's, uh, I, I think, a, 
a, a really cool technique. We're using it on um, a couple of applications. Um, this is uh, this like epoxy and beads, something we're uh, simulating as part of the PSAP Center. Um, and it, these methods are also good for implicit dynamics. Um, I think I'll uh, close there. So uh, I don't get us further off the, uh, off of time, but uh, I'd love to uh, take a question if there's time for that. Thank you, Jet. Thank you. Very, very cool stuff. Um, so there was one quick question in the chat. Um, how do you precondition matrix three problems? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, um, let me drop a, I'll drop a preprint in the chat. The short answer is we use Chebyshev Jacobi smoothing on the matrix three levels and algebraic multigrid on the course levels. And we put that in together into one B cycle. Um, I would say these are not JFNK in the traditional sense, um, like JFNK in the, the way that that term is mostly used involves uh, finite differencing to apply the Jacobian. And here we have an analytic Jacobian. It just doesn't get assembled, um, it, except on course levels where it's needed for AMG. But it, it, it's similar in uh, philosophy, I suppose. OK, other questions? We have some time. All right, let's follow up in the chat then, and let's thank Jed again. Thank you, Jed. Uh, and now we're going to switch to Paul and Malakai. Who is starting, Paul? Who will present first? Uh, I, I am. All right. Nice shirt, Jed. <laughs> I represent. <laughs> uh, all right. All right, Paul. So let's see. Yeah. All right. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, I can. Spectral all element right. code for exascale. Let's go. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about the development of NECRS, which is our new code for fluid thermal uh, applications. Um, between NECRS and, and NEC 5000, NEC CEM, we have probably about 500 users. I would guess maybe currently we have about 50 users of, of NECRS, um, maybe not quite that high yet. So it hasn't been as stress test as, as NEC 5000 has, you know, and it's been around for about 10% of the time that NEC 5000 has also. So, um, but uh, the development team is uh, led by Stefan Kirkemeyer and Malachi Phillips um, and Misan Min and uh, um, Ananias Tombolidis, all at um, Argonne or UIC, plus uh, students, Thelina Rathnaika, uh, Yushang Lan, and then um, Ilya Mirzari, James Lattice, and Alex Obabko, and then tremendous help from Tim and his team, um, and Tim and Noel um, in particular. So just to kind of illustrate the types of problems we're interested in. We're interested in complex domains, complex physics. This one is actually a NEC 5000 um, simulation, but it could be done with NEC RS now. We do support um, uh, uh, ALE, so mesh motion, and we support WOMOC. Um, so this is compressed turbulence um, in the compression stroke of a, of a um, four valve um, cylinder. Um, so just kind of a little bit of background. Uh, NEC 5000 is our spectral element based thermal fluid solver. Um, it, it is still um, a development platform. Uh, you know, not everybody has converted over to, uh, to NEC RS yet. Um, supports incompressible low mock ALE based moving mesh, which NEC RS also does at this point. Scales to millions of ranks. So you know, we understand how to scale to very large processor counts. We've scaled up to 3 million on Sequoia and um, to 800,000, or no, actually to uh, twice 800,000 on Mira. Um, and we know also that, you know, we hit 80% efficiency around uh, and over about 4,000. Next CEM, a similar story, uh, especially for electromagnetics, um, we get to about 600 um, uh, grid points for 80% efficiency, 
It's an explicit code, so it doesn't have an implicit part. And plus, there are six degrees of freedom per grid point, so you can amortize the uh, uh, interprocessor latency. Um, and so that explains the discrepancy between these numbers here. So then NECRS, um, it's our GPU slash CPU oriented version of NEC 5000. It's based on AUKA uh, and C++. We made this choice early on for portability reasons. Uh, it's very helpful when Tim Warburton has AUKA on, his, on the license plate of his car, you think, okay, that's a piece of software that's gonna be around for a while. Um, the, uh, the high performance GPU kernels are based on, on libparanumal. And uh, Tim and, and Noel have been very helpful in getting uh, those up to snuff on um, the MI250 and also on the A100 impact. Um, so we are approximately roof line bound as um, Tim indicated in his talk. The largest processor count we've run NECRS so far is uh, 27,000 V100s on Summit. So that's all of Summit. We hit 80% um, efficiency for um, N over P of about 2 million. So about 2 million uh, points per, uh, per V100. Anecdotally, users are seeing a 3x performance um, gains in production runs compared to production runs on Mira. So Mira is an old architecture, but um, it was a very big machine and there were a lot of people doing production runs on Mira. And they are absolutely delighted um, when they run uh, NECRS. Uh, the comment is always that it is fast. So they're, they're, they're happy. Um, I'll just go through a quick schematic of our solver for the Navier-Stokes equations. Basically, we have an explicit update. Um, this operation is de-aliased, as Tim uh, mentioned. So it is somewhat, um, um, well, both memory and um, uh, flop intensive. It is potentially expensive if this nonlinear update, if we use a characteristics method, uh, where we take, uh, it's basically a subcycling type method where we do multiple steps um, to get the nonlinear contributions. Um, the next step is the divergence-free projection. So you wanna project out the non-divergence-free part of that. That involves solving a Poisson equation with um, some special boundary conditions such that you um, uh, can sustain either second or third order accuracy in time. Um, this is 80%, 80 to 90% of the solve time. And, and people often say, oh, NEC requires 80%, 90% of its solve time for the pressure or, you know, spectral elements require that. Actually, no, it's completely intrinsic to the physics. This is absolutely the fastest time scale in the problem. It is replacing the acoustic waves and um, it is communication intensive. Um, so it's, it's not surprising. If, if, if you are in a situation where it's not 80% to 90%, um, you might have to ask uh, why that is so. Um, and then there's a viscous update. That's not too hard. These um, Helmholtz matrices are the, you know, B is the diagonal mass matrix plus, oh, there should have been a one over Reynolds number in front of this, one over Reynolds number delta T times A. So Jacobi preconditioned conjugate gradients is perfectly fine for this. So let's just look a little bit. Malachi is gonna talk about preconditioning the pressure solve. Um, before we get there, we do uh, leverage the fact that these problems, as we time step, we're, we're solving this problem thousands of times per um, simulation. And each solution is a perturbation of the one that came before it. In fact, um, so you can, you can project onto the space of prior solutions. All you do is uh, after you get a new solution, you um, orthogonalize it with respect to the A inner product. Um, and if it's orthonormal, then P bar is, um, just a linear combination of these, these uh, a orthonormal um, uh, basis vectors and the coefficients are given by the inner product with the right-hand side B. Uh, so this requires no matrix vector products at this stage. There is a matrix vector product down here. Uh, well, actually you, depending, you can either, usually it's probably better to actually do, do a matrix vector product because once you have P bar, you need B bar, which would be AP bar in order to solve for this uh, perturbed problem. And you solve this for, a fixed tolerance epsilon. So we can re reduce the um, initial residual quite a bit by this. In fact, you can show that it's O of delta T to the L plus O of epsilon. So where epsilon is your iteration tolerance. Okay, so um, last year we looked at um, 
this calculation is quite a large calculation, uh, about 100 million spectral elements of order eight, so about 51 billion grid points. Uh, Pre-tuning, here's what the breakdown was. We spent about 45% of the time in the coarse grid solve, 90% of the time in the um, pressure solve. I won't talk about the others because these are the main ones. And the question is, what can we do about the coarse grid solve? So this is a P multigrid. At the coarsest level, we have um, a linear finite element, so about 100 million degrees of freedom, about 8,000 degrees of freedom per, um, per GPU. Um, so faced with this, the only thing to do was to put more pressure on the fine, um, uh, to, to improve the smoothers at the fine grid levels, at the, at the intermediate levels, and thereby reduce the number of iterations. And we got the, the fraction of time spent in the course grid down to 11%. Moreover, at the end of, of an extensive tuning exercise, we're able to solve um, in six hours of wall clock time, a, a, a total flow through time through this full core reactor. Um, again, that was um, quite good news for the, for the nuclear engineers. Uh, so these are the various steps that we did. I won't go through all of these. Um, I'll mention, Tim mentioned the, you know, we typically use uh, N equal to, th you know, the number of quadrature points is three halves times the, number of um, nodal points for the nonlinear term. That's not actually absolutely mandatory. I mean, theoretically it appears to be, but in practice, you don't have to. If the thing is stable, um, you can go get, get away with a lower number. So we did that. Um, and then we also increased the number of projection vectors from eight up to 30. You can see that that brought our time down um, from 0.426 seconds per time step to 0.3. So pretty significant uh, reduction by, um, uh, um, doing that. Okay. Um, NECRS is, is also a, a very reasonable uh, CPU code. Um, we've compared it to several other uh, codes that are out there, several modern codes. Um, and uh, the CPU performance is, is comparable to, uh, to what these other authors are getting. Um, and you, but you can see we, we on the A100, we can um, have quite low uh, time per time step for this uh, Taylor Green Vortex benchmark, which is kind of a popular benchmark. Okay. And then finally, um, on a variety of, of um, architectures, these uh, MI250X results are somewhat dated. They don't, I think, have all of the updates that uh, Tim and Noel have been working on. But um, I just put this out here to indicate that you know, we are um, doing extensive tests on, um, on basically every architecture that we have access to. So there I'm gonna stop and turn it over to Malachi, if you're ready, Malachi. Yeah, so can everyone see my screen uh, and my cursor? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so as, uh, as Paul mentioned, the Poisson solve encompasses the majority of the solution time for us. So, uh, and something to note is um, while we have EP cubed uh, unknowns in our problem, if we were to assemble the actual matrix, we'd be uh, having a system with EP the six non zeros. However, uh, the reason why you'd want to go matrix free with high order methods is because you can exploit this tensor product sum factorization to reduce the cost of applying the matrix vector prop, uh, product to EP to the fourth. Uh, however, once you go matrix three, you also have to introduce some good preconditioner strategies. And so that's why I'll be talking about. So some of the solver technology that we have in NECRS includes the solution projection for initial guess generation that Paul was talking about. Uh, we have two different KSPs that we support, which are Flex CG and GMRES. And then for preconditioners, uh, we precondition based on the low order operator known as SimFem, as well as using geometric P multigrid uh, with various smoother choices, including Schwartz, restricted additive Schwartz, uh, and Chebyshev accelerated smoothing based on Jacobi, as well as Schwartz smoothing. So the idea behind SimFem is to precondition the high order system with a low order discretization with coinciding nodes. Orzag demonstrated that the preconditioned operator has a condition number scaling like pi squared over four. Uh, and so in a, in a similar paper, Bello, Maldonado, and Fisher proposed a one tetrahedron per vertex scheme, 
which we will be using here. But uh, the way that we actually solve that is with a single V cycle of AMGX using damp Jacobi. And I wanted to note that other approaches exist, such as that uh, from Will Pasner, but I won't be talking about that today. So for our Schwartz-based methods, we draw up different subdomains that are tied to each individual element. We take the nodes from the element and extend it by two in each direction and apply this homogeneous Dirichlet boundary condition on the edge. And the way that we apply this is we restrict our degrees of freedom to the subdomain, solve the subdomain problem, then prolongate back and apply some sort of weighting to it. And so one question is, how do you form the, the inverse subdomain operator? Well, one approach is to use a Glurkin approach. However, this would end up ruining your cubic storage and quartic work per element that we want to maintain. So what we do instead is we draw these box-like approximations on each of these elements in order to apply the fast diagonalization method. And this allows us to recover the cubic storage and quartic work per element. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about Chebyshev smoothing. The idea behind this is we construct a Chebyshev polynomial of uh, the smoothed operator that it's minimum in some interval lambda min to lambda max. This requires having some sort of estimate for the maximum eigenvalue, which we do so using 10 Arnoldi iterations. Uh, and then we use these constant coefficients to, to sort of give a, a safety bound to it. Traditionally, this smoother is based on the inverse diagonal of A or Jacobi-based smoothing. Uh, however, there's no reason why you couldn't apply something like a Schwartz smoother, uh, which is kind of a novel approach that we've used in NECRS for some time. And the effect of this is the Chebyshev acceleration robustifies the pointwise Jacobi smoothing. Uh, and it has a similar effect when you apply it with short smoothing, thereby improving the multigrid convergence and leading to a lower iteration count and faster time to solution. So I have four different test cases that I'll be talking about today. The top two are uh, densely packed spheres in this cylinder. These are based off of an all hex meshing strategy that's developed by Yushan Lan uh, and coworkers. C is a, a similar case. However, it's meshed using a, a tet, to, uh, tet to hex meshing strategy developed by Haoman Huan. And then lastly, in case D, I have a, a three-dimensional DNS of a Boeing speed bump problem, uh, which we will be considering. And I'm basically going to look at the time per pressure solve for the first 2,000 steps and see which sort of solvers work best. All these results are on uh, Summit, which is 42 power 9, 6 NVIDIA V100s. Uh, we use one CPU per GPU. And at the coarsest level, we solve using one Boomer AMG V cycle on the CPU. And then lastly, a uh, note of bookkeeping, PMG731 Chebby ASM2 is our way of denoting that we're using a P multigrid preconditioner that uses a second order Chebby Cheb accelerated ASM smoother with P's equal to seven, three, and one as our multigrid levels. So the, the first result I want to show you here is the time per pressure solve uh, is strong scaling for the Boeing speed bump problem. We have here on the X axis, this is the time per pressure solve. And on the Y axis is grid points per time per solve per node, which is sort of a measure of the work rate per node. And we start from P is equal to 96 processors. Uh, and then we scale up all the way to P is equal to 432. Uh, and so some of the things that I want to note on this plot is first off as a user, if you're uh, running this case, you as a user specify some processor count, and then you would kind of uh, try out these different preconditioner strategies until you land on one that you're sufficiently happy with. So in this case, we see here that using a multi-grid based preconditioner that's built off of a Chevy Chev RAS smoother ends up being the fastest. Um, Similarly, if we move to the 146 pebble case, we see again that our P multigrid based Chebyshev Schwartz, uh, Chebyshev RAS smoother is the fastest in terms of time per pressure solve. When we move to this 1568 pebble case, we see here that SEMFEM uh, and the P multigrid based method based on Chebyshev uh, ASM are comparable, but SEMFEM is a, a slight improvement. 
lastly, though, we look at this 67 pebble case and here uh, really SEMFEM is the only sort of reasonable preconditioning strategy here. Um, you gain a factor of 4x uh, reduction in the time per pressure solved by swapping from our best multigrid based uh, preconditioner to SEMFEM. And I'd like to note that you know, this is sort of a, a difficult problem for us because of this sort of weird mesh that we have that's from uh, the tet to hex meshing strategy. However, I would note that, you know, this is not a contrived case. This is a, a real case that a user had. Uh, and, you know, this tet to hex meshing strategy is very commonly used in that it's sort of the fastest way to bootstrap your case. Uh, and we want to make sure that we support that well. So I've shown here uh, an extensive exploration of some different preconditioning strategies. Uh, you can see a lot more in this linked paper down here, uh, tuning spectral element preconditioners for parallel scalability on GPUs. In short, uh, our P multigrid based methods typically are best or comparable to SIMFIM. However, when it comes to this complex geometry uh, that, that's found in this 67 pebble case, um, Really, SEMFEM is the only option here. And sort of the conclusion that I would draw from this is it, it helps to have a, a wide sort of suite of these different preconditioning strategies. And that even having some sort of auto selection during runtime is a, a sort of useful thing that uh, can sort of automatically pick this best preconditioner for the user. Uh, and that these are all very important for general production level codes. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions if we have time. Well, first, thank you both Paul and Malakai. Some virtual clapping for you. Um, we have uh, we have a time for maybe one or two quick questions. Can you maybe it's just me, uh, Malakai? Can you go back to those uh, graphs? I'm finding it pretty hard to glean a takeaway from can, can you just explain to me what what i'm supposed to take away from the graph here because there's, there's a lot going on yeah yeah there is and sorry i was kind of uh <laughs> rushed in my explanation of it so on this x-axis here that's what you as a user see um this is how long it takes to solve your problem so obviously what you want to be is all the way over to the left but at the same time you don't want to burn uh computational resources if you don't have to. And so we have on this y-axis here, this is basically your, your effective work rate. And so as you strong scale on this problem, you expect to see a, a lower time per solve as you have more, uh, more processors available to you. However, you also introduce some communication overhead. And so that, that tends to hurt the effective work rate that you reach. And so from this plot, uh, you can kind of figure out where you should be uh, to reach, say, 80% parallel efficiency. And once you're at that point, uh, you know, we determine that that's, you know, like a, a reasonable point that a user would choose to run their problem at. And that gives us the overall time per pressure solve. And so uh, the sort of uh, quick takeaway from this plot is you want to be up and over to the left, because that indicates that you're very fast and you're also getting um, fast solves. Uh, and that as you start to increase the number of processors, you, you see this sort of tailing off. Um, and this is, if you go over to this, which is the Boeing speed bump problem, once you go past a certain uh, count, you know, the, the effects of the increased uh, communication overhead start to actually hurt you in terms of the time per pressure solve. All right, thanks again, uh, Malakai, Paul. Um, let's switch uh, to Misson. Misson, are you ready to share? Yes. All right, so we've been moving progressively from an overview of the project and the kernels, mini apps, um, NECRS, and now we're going to the big applications, ECP applications that Mission is going to discuss. 
Do you see my screen? Uh, I see your screen, but not the slides. Oh. Not, the slides are not shared yet. Yep. Okay, so I already talked about some of the applications. I think this one is going to focus here on the applications that are using NEC. Uh, is this okay? Yep, looks good. Okay, thanks, Janio. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, <laughs> I'll be just focusing on NEC-based seed applications. Um, this is uh, joined well with a PhD student who um, from multiple universities who did um, Argon internships. And also, so, and also the effort is coming from the collaboration from uh, different labs, including um, NREL, and also people from Argon and universities. So I'll be demonstrating some of the application runs at large scale and show performance uh, studies on full system based on V100 and also show uh, portability and performance on various architectures, including A100 and MI200X machines. And also um, discuss some of the algorithms and modeling approaches, which will help extending the simulation capabilities of our code. The main, uh, some of the detail will be uh, uh, going into the applications for XSMR, Excel Wind, um, and also discuss some uh, overview on the uh, non ECP applications, including um, NIMS project uh, for molten salt reactor and other um, applications uh, regarding on the aerosol transport simulations. Okay, so CD Excel Wind collaboration has been uh, now uh, more than two uh, years of collaboration. Now we, we start having a very interesting result. So uh, we consider here two um, open source CFT code from seed. We have um, NEC 5000, NEC RS, and also uh, Excel Wind team uh, we're using AMI Wind. And our goal is to code develop the code uh, to improve model fidelity and performance, which is critical for running um, uh, atmospheric boundary layer based applications for wind farm analysis. Uh, we have some scaling studies for benchmark problem gables, uh, and we do also cross validation for areas models and also convergence studies, um, very detailed for different models. And I will show some of those um, recent results here. So for uh, what equation we are solving, uh, incompressible Navier-Stokes equations, and on the right-hand side, uh, the forcing terms are um, described there. And for the stress tensor in momentum and energy equations, uh, we have the following form on the right-hand side. And then here for the under-resolved sub the scale model terms are appearing there on the right. Um, and we choose of the two different codes, uh, we're using different approaches for LES and also SGS um, model. The 5000 is high-pass filter-based approach for LES. AMI wind is using the standard Smegorinsky model and NEC RS, NEC 5000 uh, is uh, based on high order spectral element method while AMI wind is using block structured second order with uh, adaptive mesh refinement capabilities. For um, NEC code, we are fixing the order N equal X when we do comparison. So um, here for NEC 5000, uh, so, so using NEC 5000 NEC RS, when you're running performance, we run NEC RS, but initial development for the algorithm um, work, we are using, we develop first in NEC 5000 and we verify everything. And we also do cross comparison between NEC 5000 NEC RS uh, for the modeling approaches. And then we move on to, uh, once we verify, we move on to uh, performance comparisons. So how we initiated with this work, uh, we initially didn't know that there's a uh, traction boundary condition was necessary. So we initiated with HPF model type as filter with no traction boundary condition. And when you are uh, running the uh, mean profile uh, comparison, once you choose um, the different Reynolds number, there was a discrepancy it was changing based on uh, what Reynolds number you are choosing. So we uh, figured that the traction boundary condition condition was important. So that was the next stage, but then still there was a still problem. So now um, what we have is high pass filter plus a subgrid sub scale modeling and then traction boundary all together. So right inside, uh, what I'm showing is from low resolution to high resolution. Low resolution is about representing three point, about three meter on the right hand side is about one meter case and 
up uh, the upper panel is uh, neck, by, uh, neck RS and lower ones are uh, AMR wind, which is based on standard Smegorinsky model. And if you look at the um, neck 5000 neck RS, um, it captures, it looks like it's capturing very detailed structures, but it doesn't look like flow patterns. While um, AMR wind is showing the flow pattern, more like flow pattern from low resolution to high resolution. So we're working on uh, testing out uh, the same approaches that AMR wind is having. So Smegorin's model with SGS um, and traction boundary condition is currently ongoing. We are getting a reasonable result at lower resolution, but we don't have uh, the full um, uh, data set for the higher resolution cases. So here I don't show it, but it's going to be coming up in the um, uh, in the upcoming papers that are listed in here in uh, number two. So here, um, so what do we look at for the cross validation? We are looking at the mean profile uh, from uh, two different code. We actually extend to many other uh, different code also at, at, at the end, but here I'm showing only two different code uh, comparison. Um, we are looking at uh, the mean profiles at different physical time, usually from one hour to 10 hours. And we specifically interested in six hours and seven hours, and eight hours that shows um, uh, more uh, reasonable, um, reasonable um, uh, description for the, uh, the phenomena. So here, uh, if you look at the left-hand side, that's neck RS run and right-hand side is AMI wind run. And we're looking at the nose peak on the right-hand side um, that I put uh, the white arrow there. So at different height, uh, you will have different uh, velocity magnitude. And for neck RS, it's having lower, um, the nose peak at lower uh, height. And while AMI wind is having uh, the nose peak a little bit higher uh, in uh, G direction. So this is what we are looking at for comparison. And uh, we do, um, we're going to have the full set of uh, comparison between different models uh, coming from uh, NEC for different models. And we are going to compare with the AM, AMI wind on top of each other. Um, regardless of what, uh, modeling approach we are using, the performance is not much different. So, so we have done uh, the scaling test for strong uh, scaling and also weak scaling. Uh, when we are doing testing, we fix the domain size and we fix also the resolution. We fix the time step size, but uh, we uh, let each code choose the best time stepper. Time stepper. So on the right hand side, uh, based on that one, uh, we show a different size of problems for strong scaling. The top uh, panels are, uh, the top one and the second rows are actually the same um, data set, but we are using a uh, different normalization for the x-axis. So we the metric that we like uh, for str strong scaling um, so far is the one uh, using the, how many uh, how many grid point you're using per GPU. So if you look at um, on the right hand side for efficiency, if you look at the 80% efficiency, NEC um, RS is using two million grid point per GPU, uh, while um, the AMI wind is showing um, more than 3 million grid point to achieve 80% efficiency. Uh, from the weak scaling, uh, we can see that it's about like two times uh, faster when you're using um, NEC RS. So AMI wind, both teams are trying to improve the performance uh, better. This is just baseline. So it's a, just current status of the performance. We are trying to improve it. Okay, I'm moving on to the next, um, the XSMI collaboration um, with SEED. Um, it has been uh, more than, uh, from the beginning, it has been uh, our main uh, focus of the uh, applications. So here uh, we are looking at the, um, the geometries uh, for XSMI is um, the 17 by 17 geometry on the left-hand side. Uh, and you have like 37 of 17 by 17, um, rod geometry, the assembly is showing up on the right hand side and the right hand side the geometry is the core of the full core rod geometry. And we extend it in the streamwise velocity, uh, the streamwise direction. Uh, and then you make the problem size very large and we test um, on summit with full scale 
scaling strong uh, scaling performance um, test. Uh, in here, so we also go with same uh, for net five thousand. So for net five thousand, we have done a simulation. We are able to we have the capability of running more than one billion element um, support uh, using one hundred twenty. Five billion grid point on full summit, full CPUs. Um, we are working on extending net RS capability to reach um, to this level these days. And this is the uh, the strong scaling and weak scaling test for 17 by 17 geometry, which is simpler than uh, the other full core geometry. Here uh, on the right hand side, you can see the efficient to achieve 80 percent efficiency using 2.4 between 2.4 to 2.7 million, we are getting good um, strong scaling at the uh, level of 80% efficiency. And also weak scaling is even doing better um, the all the way down using uh, full motion, uh, it's keeping more than 80% while you are, while we're using almost uh, the strong scale limit uh, or below uh, strong scale limit, 2.1 million grid point per GPU. But if you look at the full core uh, geometry, uh, the weak scaling is losing um, the efficiency uh, starting from 800 node, uh, it's achieving only 67 efficiency. Uh, but strong scale, uh, that's because the geometry, the connectivity of the mesh, the mesh partitioning is um, different than the other one, but a lot more com complicated. Uh, but this, the other, but then strong, still strong scaling uh, result. Uh, we are getting uh, the similar uh, result between 2.2 million grid point and 2.7 million grid point. We are achieving 80 percent um, efficiency. And the, some of the detailed studies uh, is showing up, will be showing up in the other uh, paper I put um, at the bottom. Uh, here I'm showing uh, the portability and performance of um, NEC RS. Uh, running on uh, different machines. The first one I put uh, for the comparison is A100 result as one. And then I compare with other um, uh, performance for single rod geometry for XSMI um, geometry, uh, compar comparison to V100, MI100, MI250X. Um, compared to A100, we are achieving 80% uh, speed up, 80% speed up with uh, Crusher and uh, spark uh, is even lower and summit uh, it's uh, remaining as about 74% uh, uh, of uh, A100. Okay, another uh, applications that we are working on uh, with high potential uh, that we can do <laughs> the contribution is for NIMS problems for um, potential usage for molten salt reactor simulations. Here we are uh, developing PMP um, Navier spoke stock solver, uh, including um, the energy equations, which is uh, written on the left hand side with full set of the uh, governing equations. And once you make it uh, into the uh, non dimensionalization form, you can actually see that the equation can be expressed by the Schmidt number and Preden number. So that uh, the challenging issues here for this problem uh, is it has very high Schmidt number. Uh, so that uh, the um, from the equation on the right hand side, we can see um, the it's a convection highly convection dominated. Once you have a high Schumann number and high platinum number, so we are working on this. This is purely multi scale and multi physics problem. Very complicated system. We have some of the um, uh, preliminary result at the bottom. That that was uh, some of the old result with um, with only PMP only. And these days we are working on um, showing the uh, validation of our PMP and its solver with using exact solutions. So we'll have more uh, result in uh, that we can share in the upcoming meetings. Okay, um, so this is the, the application uh, that's using a uh, fine point, which is developed originally by James Lattice and uh, Paul Fisher. And we are extending, it's very important that um, lots of other applications are really needing these features in uh, running on GPUs. So with uh, this is somewhat in turn, uh, Neil, um, with Neil, we developed a neck neck and particle tracking support. Uh, that is utilizing the fine point. So all this GP porting is done and that is available in one of the branch uh, of our repo and it's going to be um, soon released in the next, uh, in the upcoming NEC RS release. And we have done testing um, 
for some of the geometry on the left hand side for this is the multiple mesh multi mesh um, capability uh, demonstration uh, using this is 3D simulations uh, it's having a square analysis inside and then rotating cylinder um, left hand side is two meshes on the right hand side it's one mesh so you, uh, with, with no mesh structure so you actually don't see um, when you are doing a simulation while having uh, multiple meshes. And this is another example uh, based on the fine point um, capability applied for particle tracking um, uh, problems. Uh, so we applied uh, the particle, particle tracking um, support for ABL, the atmospheric boundary layer problems, and also the pebble bed, which has um, about 146 um, pebbles on the right hand side. Uh, we can actually track how the flows are moving based on by putting some of the particle into it, and we can actually analyze how the particle is spreading or it's not, um, how it's behaving inside, uh, so that you can see flow, uh, you can see some inside of the flow patterns uh, from this. And a uh, good uh, motivation of uh, working on uh, the um, particle tracking, uh, the fine point on GPU was that uh, th there are application need uh, coming from uh, two different approaches, uh, two different problem set here. On the left hand side, uh, the simulation was done by Net5000 on CPU from uh, Ramesh and on the right hand side, uh, the fluid spray um, tracking Tracking uh, for IC engine simulations by um, Somil. So here, yeah, that's the um, the very good potential of using the capability once we have um, available in public. Okay, so yep, uh, just summary. Um, I showed uh, the LDS modeling and performance studies for ABL flow between with comparison between NEC and um, AMI Win code and also show, showed some performance studies at full scale um, summit machine for strong and weak scaling for really large scale problems for XSMR. And I shared some of the ongoing work with NIMS project uh, for PMP NS server and also the GPU extension potential that can be applied for particle tracking uh, for engine simulation and uh, aerodrome transport research, which will be related to COVID-19 uh, stops. Yep, that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Misson. All right, any uh, quick questions for Misson? All right, well, we're over time, so um, uh, you can uh, catch us up at the poster session that is starting in about an hour. So the city has a poster there. Feel free to um, come stop by. I think it's going for two hours and uh, we can talk more. I also posted in the chat the links to the SEED website uh, where you will uh, find a lot of uh, this information, a lot of the publications, as well as the last, um, the latest milestone report, SEED MS38, uh, as well as the link to the SEED annual meeting. So if you like what you saw today and you want to spend three days with us um, in person at Urbana Champagne, please, uh, please register and come join us. We'll, we'd love to have you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. This was great. Thanks.